You can turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to page 907 at this time. We are continuing in with the doctrinal preaching of our church with the Canons of Dort. The Canons of Dort are concerned about one premier word. That word is grace. Grace came on in freshness and in power in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, that grace became toned down, dimmed, and challenged by the assertion of an Arminian point of view. The Canons of Dort rose up as a synod to answer that resurgence of the flesh of works with God's sovereign grace. We're not going to read the canons right now. I'm going to incorporate them into the sermon. But we are looking at Articles 4, 5, and 6. We have looked at Articles 1 on predestination. Article 2, on the extent of the atonement that matches God's predestination. And we have come to understand that the atonement of Jesus Christ is powerful and effectual, that it accomplishes what it sets out to do. Thus, it is limited in its scope and extent. As Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. And now we're looking at heads three and four, which are joined together because they have to do both with the same thing, the human heart, with the corruption and conversion of the human heart. And so we are going to proceed uh, in that light today with Articles 4, 5, and 6. But first, uh, let's read uh, our text for today. Uh, this is, you might say in many ways, this is the New Testament uh, text that matches up with what we sang in Psalm 19, having to do with the revelation of God in, in creation. So we're reading Romans 1, verse 15 through 21. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, having to do with the fact that the law of God is written on the human heart, because that heart is the image of God. Romans 2.14, For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. Then Romans chapter 4, 1 through 8. We have what Paul provides as two Old Testament examples demonstrating that his gospel, the righteousness which is by faith, is not brand new. It was in the Old Testament. 
You see it with Abraham, to whom the Lord imputed righteousness by faith. And we see it in David, the flip side of that, where God does not impute his sins to him by faith. So two sides of the gospel coin, the imputation of righteousness and the non-imputation of sin. Abraham and David being the premier examples. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, or for our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count more, that's the same word, will not count impute his sin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray now that you bring light into our hearts regarding your redemptive purposes and in the meaning and significance of the revelation we have in both nature, in the law, and in the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a fundamental law of medicine, which is in many ways rhetorically self-evident. That is, in order to correct a disease, you must correctly diagnose the disease and then provide the matching therapy or medication for that disease. For example, a Band-Aid won't bring your temperature down. An aspirin won't cure cancer. Chemotherapy will not heal a broken bone. And a cast will not promote the healing of a cut. Examples of mismatched cures or medications or therapies for maladies. So we must understand the problem first in order to understand the correct and matching solution to the problem. And what is true in the physical is also true in the spiritual. Now last week we began these uh, heads of three and four in the canon of Dort, human corruption and conversion. And we've seen that there is a contagion of spiritual disease called sin that has infected the entire human race. The first one being infected was our father Adam. And thus everyone born since Adam is born in union with him with his guilt and corruption of nature and consequent death, spiritual, eventual physical, and if not resolved, eternal death. So we are not only dead in our trespasses and sins, but the Bible also makes clear, as we have seen, we're captives to sin and Satan. We're, in our fallenness, we're ruled by darkness, and even as believers, we're still in combat with it, clouded by it. And in our fallenness, we are unwitting, even though we may not say it, we may be very moral and upright and you know, well-washed and well-dressed people, yet apart from Christ, we are captives of the devil. That's the spiritual condition of this world. Our sin sides with Satan, whether it's conscious or not. And because of our blindness, we tend to have trouble with seeing how bad, how evil, how fallen, and how helpless our plight is. We're in the dark, groping around, looking for life's answers. We sense it. Something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with the world. What is it? 
Well, God helps us. He doesn't just leave us to grope around in the dark. He helps bring light into our dark souls. He brings it in revealing Himself in the creation. Reveals Himself more specifically in the law of the Ten Commandments, but gloriously in Jesus Christ. So first, we must see our problem, which nature and the law enables us to diagnose. And then we must see the solution. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. God helps us in both of these, and apart from His sovereign Spirit at work, we will remain groping about and groaning about through life. If you have your outline with you, with you, you see the first one is the law of nature. The Canons of Dort number four addresses this. And if you have your uh, Psalter, you can look at that. Article four on page 907. A twofold, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm behind. I got to get current. Here we go. I'm way behind. There we go. Article 4. The inadequacy of the light of nature. There is, to be sure, a certain light of nature remaining in man after the fall by virtue of which he retains some notions about God, natural things, and the difference between what is moral and immoral. And he demonstrates a certain eagerness for virtue and for good outward behavior. But this light of nature is far from enabling man to come to a saving knowledge of God and conversion to Him. So far, in fact, that man does not use it rightly, even in matters of nature and society. Instead, in various ways, he completely distorts this light, whatever its precise character, and suppresses it in unrighteousness. Now, that's lifting the very words from Romans 1. Suppresses it in unrighteousness. In doing so, he renders himself without excuse before God. There it is, Romans 1. 18 through 20, God shines His light for all to see. Now, consequently, the, the question isn't, can, can I know God exists? That's usually how it's posed. Can I know that God exists? Is there some kind of proof? You know, is something going to happen? Oh, there He is. I, you know. Or can I somehow be walked through a series of logical sequential proofs that, to conclude infallible, infallibly now? Yes, we just proved it, logic, rationally. God exists, no doubt about it. So that, that's can I know. But notice what Paul says in Romans 1. It's not asking can you know, it's you know. <laughs> you know He exists because He's revealed Himself. His invisible attributes, His divine power, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that you are without excuse, Paul said. You know. You possess that knowledge. Because God has spoken as it is, not through words, just like what we sang in Psalm 19. It says, you know, there's no words, but nonetheless, in a sense, there are words because God is being made known the creation. And when God speaks, agnosticism is it's over. As much as you might say, well, I'm an agnostic. You know, Agnostic means that you don't know. Ah, uh, uh, not. Gnostic knowledge. No, not, I don't have no knowledge. Well, that's not true. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says here that it's so pronounced that we are obligated to respond to it with honoring God and thanking Him. Verse 21. We don't, even though we know we should. 
even though he is revealed in all these ways. And that means that we, being the image of God, are knowers. We're not blank slates hoping someone will write something informative upon them. We are knowers. We're in the image of God and in fruitful contact with Him. But we prefer, as verse uh, 18 and 21 indicate, verse 18, we prefer to suppress that truth because it's an inconvenient truth for us in our rebellion against God and wanting to be able to live, uh, being benefited by his, his gifts of life, but not obligated to him as a worshiper. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, verse 21, but they became futile in their thinking. Their hearts were darkened. I was a philosophy minor in college back in the 70s. And the history of philosophy is a very interesting history. But it all kinds of ends in the same place. <laughs> I don't know. Duh. Those are some of the greatest minds being brought to the task of human thought. What they know they suppress and pretend they can construct out of sheer human thought, meaning and significance in a cohesive view of life. It ends in tragic failure with the existentialists in atheism. The problem, Paul points out, is the unrepentant and dark commitment to love the creation rather than the creator. Uh, rather than putting the Creator as the object from which all things flow and which I should rightly flow back to in worship and thanks and love and devotion, the Creator and the creation get reversed. As Augustine says, we, we love things and use God when we should love God and use things. Because the sovereign self wants to displace God and do its own will and construct its own life. Which was the inaugural temptation, was it not? You will be like God's, knowing good and evil. Even Jesus ruthlessly accuses us in John chapter 3, that in our fallen natures we love the darkness and hate the light. And so we find right there in that article number four, don't we? This light of nature is far from enabling man to come to a saving knowledge of God and conversion to Him. Instead, in various ways, he completely distorts this light, whatever its precise character, and suppresses it in unrighteousness and renders himself without excuse before God. Well, that's the light of nature that comes to us, but there is also the light of the law, the law that's given on tablets. That's language. That's precise. That's clearer, crisper more concrete. So Article 5, Article 4 talked about the inadequacy of the light of nature. Article 5 says the inadequacy of the law. In this respect, what is true of the light of nature is true also of the Ten Commandments given by God through Moses specifically to the Jews. For man cannot obtain saving grace through the Decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, because although it does expose the magnitude of his sin and increasingly convict him of his guilt, yet it does not offer a remedy or enable him to escape from his misery, and indeed, weakened as it is by the flesh, leaves the offender under the curse. The law is a greater light 
to help us peer in and understand who we are and the darkness that surrounds us. That law is recorded in writing on Mount Sinai. And as Israel went up Mount Sinai to receive that law, they were bound to it. They said to God upon receiving those Ten Commandments, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. It sounds reasonable. He has delivered us out of Egypt. He will protect us if we stay true to Him. He will bless us. We just follow these ten things. All the Lord has spoken we will do. And so covenant contract occurred. And as you read the storyline, you'll find that Israel drifted. With whatever good intentions they brought to the mount, going down the mount, it was went up in smoke. The Apostle Paul quotes Leviticus 18.5 as the modus operandi of the law. He who does these things, he who does the commandments, will live by them. You want life? You want to avoid death? Simple. Keep the commands. And so those commands shine in upon us as the pathway to life. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, that which promised life to me wound up becoming death to me because of disobedience to it. And that's the nature of those commands. The commands are calling us to do. But it's through our not doing that we become conscious of our guilt. And that, from God's redemptive perspective, is a good thing. Remember, it's a good thing to understand what the problem really is, that we might match it with its appropriate therapy, medicine, or cure. And the law helps us in this. <laughs> Remember what we read in Romans chapter 3? So through the law is the knowledge of sin. The law shines in upon us, calling us to obedience calling us to love God, calling us to love our fellow man. And it also brings this awareness and our defect in doing so. But Paul said not only was that law given on Mount Sinai, in those tablets of stone where they could read it with the finger, called the ten words, the Decalogue, that's ten words, Decalogue, but also Paul says that insofar that the law is a capturing of the nature of our relationship to God, it is also already written on the human heart, even if you're not a Jew, even if you don't read it off the tablets or from the text of Exodus chapter 20. And he says that here in chapter Romans 2. Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the laws require, and they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, and their conscience either bearing witness or accusing them. In other words, the, their, their, the conscience, even of, of, of a non-Jew, a person who doesn't know the law, will either accuse them or confirm. So if I go into the 7-Eleven down the street there, go down near the Koch's house, 7-Eleven down there, Fairmont and Cedar, if I go in there and uh, look around and make sure no one's paying any attention and I get myself a five-finger discount of a Snickers bar, and I walk out the store, my conscience says, that wasn't right, <laughs> even if I don't know the Seventh Commandment, or Eighth, com or eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, even if I don't know it, conscience lit up. But if I go in there and the inflation says I'm paying two and a quarter for a Snickers bar, and I, against my will, cough up two and a quarter and hand it over, and he hands over the Snickers bar, and I go out to 
store, my conscience says, good boy. <laughs> good girl. That pulse is it's at work in the heart. There's this commonality of ethics due to the fact that we're made in God's image, and we have that at work, obligating, Paul says, both Jew and Gentile. However, at the end of the day, upon close inspection of my own life compared to the ethics of life, I'm, I'm, I, I circle back to Romans 3, 19 and 20. The whole world is guilty before God. We're unable to find the righteousness required for life. So Augustus Top Lady says in his lovely hymn, Rock of Ages, Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. And we get this powerful message. For man cannot obtain saving grace through the Decalogue. Article number five. Because although it does expose the magnitude of his sin and increasingly convict him of its guilt, yet it does not offer a remedy doesn't offer the cure, doesn't offer the medication for the disease, or it enable him to escape from his misery. And indeed, weakened as it is by the flesh, it leaves the offender under the curse. There it is. Now you might ask, well, what good is God's law then? Uh, it, it, you know, God requires me to do it, but uh, I, I'm unable to do it, and all I wind up finding out is I'm guilty before again. What good is that law? Well, what good is it is it's a wonderful, fantastic diagnostic tool. When you go to your doctor, you want your doctor to have the best diagnostic tools available when he checks you out, don't you? I do. I hope he's got the best stuff. Diagnostic. Dia. Gnostic, knowledge, through knowledge, it's a tool by which I gain and acquire knowledge. That's a diagnostic tool. And so the law helps us to realize our condition, to diagnose our disease so that we might Pursue the remedy. And there is only one remedy that matches that disease. Search high and yon. Search wide and far. Search deep and low. You only find one rem remedy that matches that disease. Only one, and that's in Jesus Christ. God has indeed provided a remedy through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. He has resolved our legal issues of being guilty, condemned, and in captivity to the very sin that leads us to that guilt. He's the one that brings us deliverance from the guilt and grip of that disease of sin. And he tells us in the gospel that very thing. That in the gospel... There is a righteousness by faith by which we can live, have new life. Which brings us to the third point. And brings us to Article 6. The saving power of the gospel. What therefore neither the light of nature nor the law can do, God accomplishes by the power of the Holy Spirit through the word or the ministry of reconciliation. This is the gospel about the Messiah through which it has pleased God to save believers in both the Old and in the New Testament. There's one way of salvation, both Old and New Testaments, and that's by faith in God's promise. And so I read Romans 1, 16 and 17, that in the gospel is the power of God to salvation. 
for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. There's the need. I need righteousness. The law cannot produce it. The righteousness of God is found in the gospel. The righteousness which is by faith, spoken of initially, Paul quotes from Habakkuk, the Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk 2.4, and Paul says that's what Habakkuk is talking about. I want to set before you in Jesus Christ. So how important is it that having listened to God's voice in nature, having listened to God's voice in the commands, to now listen to his gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I've, I want to come to Rome and I want to preach the gospel. He wants people to listen to what he has to say. But God has done two things to undo what we've done. We are diseased and sick in our sin. We have, as it is, uh, joined our father Adam in taking that one big step that caused him to tumble down the stairs into the basement, uh, dumb and dizzy and bruised and beaten, and we along with him. But God can walk us up out of that basement, that dark, dingy confinement. Two steps. Two simple steps. The first step is provided by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel brings. It offers us who are unrighteous, righteousness. Now we learn that the law is a revelation of God's righteousness. But the pathway to life through the law is closed down. It's closed down because it's been washed out by a horrible flood of human sin. When we are lawbreakers because of what we have done and because of what we've not done with regard to that law. But the gospel, praise God, is a revelation of righteousness and life. Life meaning eternal life within our souls and in our bodies in the world to come, which we celebrate particularly on Easter because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the life that the gospel delivers to those who will embrace Jesus Christ. Because what has Jesus Christ done? He's done something with regard to the law. And there again, here's the great value of the law. It not only illumines us, but it helps us to understand Jesus. What did he come to do? Paul said he came to fulfill the law. Later on in chapter 10, he says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So first of all, Christ has kept its commands. And second of all, he has borne its curse. And because Christ has kept the commands of the law and borne the curse of that law, he bore the wrath of God, as it says in Romans 3.25. He is a propitiation for our sins. That means he's, he's satisfied God's justice by bearing the justice of God in our behalf. He is, in what he has done, in keeping its commands and in bearing its curse, this is the first step out of the basement. This is what God has done in Christ. He has performed perfectly the law's righteousness. And he has propitiated perfectly the law's curse. Christ's cross, you see, is the culminating demonstration of the righteousness of God. That we might have it, which is the second step. Because what Christ has accomplished must be applied. That's why Paul says the gospel is salvation for those who what? Those who believe. Those who receive it. The second step and the only other step out of the basement is to believe in Christ and what he has done. He who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how God applies the provision of the medicine to you and to me. 
We can know all about the medicine. We can break down all of its parts. We can set it up on a mantle in our house and we can extol how good it is to take it. But until we take the lid off and actually consume it, it will do us no good. And same with the gospel. We can know all about it. But it's when it is applied by God to us in the power of the Holy Spirit by faith that we are healed. That we, the unrighteous, stand before God as righteous in His sight. That we, the guilty, stand forgiven. Those are the two components of the righteousness which is by faith. Justification by faith, as seen in David and Abraham. Abraham showing us the righteousness positive by faith because of the righteousness of Christ. David showing us the forgiveness of sins by faith. And the word imputation is used in both. Imputed righteousness, non-imputation of sins. It's a legal manner, first and foremost. But when we trust in Jesus Christ and our legal issues are settled, you see, along with Christ, we are ushered, as the law promises, into life. We satisfy everything the law calls for, and we do by faith in Jesus Christ. We are catapulted along with Christ, in union with Christ, into life eternal. Paul later says in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Righteousness must be completed before life. That's what the law says. And Paul says the Spirit is life because of right. The, the indwelling Holy Spirit, which brings us the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, which brings us heavenly life to dwell within us, is acquired because first we have righteousness. A righteousness that's imputed by faith in Jesus Christ. And that does not skirt the law. That doesn't say, oh, forget the law. That way didn't work. Let's do another way. No, it it fulfills. It establishes. All the law called for is established and fulfilled and satisfied in Jesus. So when you have Jesus, you have the satisfaction of the law and you get the promise of the law. Life. Faith in Jesus Christ does not jettison the law, as Paul said in verse 31. It establishes it. And so what Jesus Christ has procured and accomplished, step one, the Holy Spirit applies to us by faith. The Holy Spirit enables us even to exercise that faith. And therein we can stand before our great, holy, righteous Creator. Righteous in His sight. Justified. Clothed in, as the reformers love to say, clothed in an alien righteousness. By alien, that means it's not your own. It's someone else's. It's Christ. <laughs> and we are transitioned from condemnation and wrath to righteousness and life in Jesus Christ. See the value of the law now? It shines in upon our lives and it shines in upon the cross to understand who we are and understand why Jesus came and what He did. The light and nature of the law, our sin is diagnosed. Its ravages are understood and by that same light, the gospel is understood. The cure is understood. Christ's blood propitiates our sins. So they might be forgiven. And Christ's righteousness clothes us that we might have a standing before God that secures life. It all comes down to one little question Have you taken the remedy? Are you just looking at it on the shelf? I'm glad somebody believes it. <laughs> it certainly comes with a lot of recommendation. The anecdotal evidence is 2,000 years old and more. But is it still sitting on the shelf? 
Don't let it sit on the shelf. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Empty hand to receive Christ. Lord Jesus, wash me. Lord Jesus, clothe me. Lord Jesus, raise me with you. He who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is the only cure, it is the only medication that matches the disease. Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. For our boasting is in God and what He has done alone. A righteousness by faith by which we can live. Live in resurrection, heavenly life. The very proclamation of Easter itself, is it not? Come to Christ, partake of Him, and live.